Hello to you friends, this is Dhamma on air number 7, but first the normal intro. Namo Tasso Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Worthy Anabha and perfectly self-enlightened is the blessed Buddha. Uh, the three first question is about the first jhana, the first absorption, and uh, the first meditative trance, you can say. And the first qu question goes like this: How does it feel when one is in first jhana? And the second is: How does one practice to attain the first jhana, the first mental absorption? Let's first say go a little over what does jhana mean uh, in Sanskrit? It means that it's kind of like a burning off, burning off the sign of the, the defilements. So while you can reduce the mental defilements in a normal state of mind, you cannot irreversibly uh, get them to go away. But that is kind of like what you do when you do jhana meditation, that you burn off the defilements so they are irreversibly eliminated from the mind. It burns through. It's a kind of breakthrough. Jhana uh, is a word in Pali. In, in, in Sanskrit it's dhyana. In Chinese it's minchan. It's uh, the, 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 the founding word of Chan uh, Buddhism. And uh, when Chan traveled to Japan they call it Zen. So uh, I think there's many Zen, many Zen Buddhists both modern and ancient, that this don't know this. That this is the etymology and the, of the word sin is actually the Pali word jhana, which is a word for a special kind of uh, mental absorption, which says eight of four rupa jhanas and four arupa jhanas. We will take the first one today uh, because it, they come in sequence. First you attain the first, then you can go f to the next one. But you cannot go to the eighth. So how to attain the first one? Or h how to, does it feel when you are in the first one? Yeah, I'll give two expositions. One is the classical one by the Buddha, and then uh, a more subjective experience from a, from a modern point of view. And the classical one goes like this. Having momentarily eliminated the five mental hindrances of sense, desire, ill will, liturgy and laziness, restlessness and regret, and doubt and uncertainty, will all, which all are defiling imperfections of the mind that obstruct concentration and understanding. Quite secluded, Viveka, from sense pleasure, separated from all disadvantageous mental states, one enters and dwells in the first jhana, absorption, of directed and sustained thought, joined with joy and pleasure, born of secluded solitude. One makes this joy and pleasure perfuse, pervade and fill the entire body so, so that all parts of this body is thrilled by this joy and pleasure, born of secluded solitude. Even as a clever barber or his apprentice would put soap powder in a brass basin, sprinkle it with water, and gradually knead it and moist it into a ball of foam, soaked thoroughly everywhere inside out, yet without dripping, so too does your noble friend pervade, perfuse, and fill his entire body. So it's completely drenched with joy and pleasure, born of secluded solitude. So this is a Buddhist explanation. You, you should imagine kind of like a mental state, like a soap, barber soap that you are kneading in a, in a brass basin. Note that it's thick, 
but it doesn't drip. There's no distractions running out of it. There's some set of factors we'll go over this, the theory of it. Another subjective experience can be like, of course, there's a, a tremendous amount of joy and pleasure, no doubt about it. At the same time, the mind is clear. It's not, it's not like a trance where you are half sleeping or anything. It's the opposite. It's ultra clear. It's, it's the clearness of the mind is like a, a day if you are riding on a horse in a clear winter day and everything is white and it's a clear frosty day and the sun is shining so the, the, the air and the light is ultra clear and ultra clean because all humidity has fallen down due to the frosty weather so it is then you can direct the horse the mind to go wherever you want and however you direct it it goes just like you want it to be so you're riding your own mind horse perfectly. It, it, it thinks whatever you want it to think. Why is it so? Because there's no distraction. Normally you, you, you start an uh, analysis, you think, ah, what's the cause of this side, this is the cause of that. But then you don't, you don't come to the end of the causal chain or the end of the thought sequence because distractions are coming in and crossing over. And then you follow the distraction. And then uh, you forget about your, your subject of thinking. So you can't kind of like uh, hold the mind back and don't let it slip away. Then you have to start all over again on the sequence of thought, the analytical sequence. Of, if this is caused to that, if A is caused to B, then B is caused to C, this C will then cause D and so on. What does it end up with? If or okay. K. So this analysis you cannot do in normal uh, mode of thinking. Uh, for example, like when you're playing chess, that also demands high concentration because you cannot lose your thread. You have to stay on the uh, and do very systematic thinking about uh, closing this option, then this option, then this option, then this option. And so kind of like cover the whole space of possibilities by systematic analysis, taking them up one by one. But that is not possible if you're distracted. But in the first jhana, there's no distractions whatsoever. This means the mind is like a train. You put the, the train on, on a rail, and then it goes right to the end of the rail. Right to the end of it. It doesn't stop. This means you could, your, your, your thinking is extremely efficient. It's directed and sustained thinking. It's extremely efficient. Vichaka vichara is called in Pali. And that's why you, the main job of analysis, Buddhist analysis, you do in the first jhana. Because it is so efficient. It basically think if you ask yourself a question that's putting the mind on the train on the rail, then you do the analysis until you get the answer. So there's no intervening. There's some job to do, but it's kind. It's not effortless, but it's not distracted. Not normally, if you put the mind on a, a sequence of thought, then it comes down here. Then it's distracted. Then you have to you have to start all over again, putting up a, a, a new rail. Then it's just, just, you come to here, then it's distracted again. Then you forget all all the the middle calculations. You have to put it up again. So you never reach the end of the, the sequence of thought. And thereby the analysis of your, your thinking will remain incomplete. You don't get the answer to the question you ask yourself. But that's not the case in the first jhana. The first jhana, you get the answer every time, all the time. That's very, very satisfying. That's even you, when you, uh, when you experience it, uh, you get more joy because it seems so swift, it seems so easy, that it's almost effortless. It is not effortless, but it's almost effortless compared to the normal situation where you kind of like have to begin again and again and again and again, and then kind of like get distracted, all kinds of strange thoughts that comes into your mind because you're crossing different 
uh, territory by going on this rail of thought. So uh, this is the uh, two uh, best explanations or similes I can give. One is the pleasure of joy and then this soap that is not dripping and the other one being out riding a perfect horse on a frosty day that goes wherever you want it to go. And you can see everything because it's so clear and white in this winter day. What, how to practice when, was the second question. Uh, yes, first of all, there is this, uh, what's uh, the cause of, of absorption? Uh, where I can also say to others a uh, way of explaining absorption is actually that uh, there's no sensation of time. That's also you have when you're absent-minded. Think of it when you're out sitting on a hill looking out at the ocean, then you suddenly can get absent-minded. You have an absence, as you say in, Fran in French. And this uh, means that you're not contactable from outside for a period of time. There also your, your, your conception of time, you have very intense uh, thinking about something, whatever comes to your mind at that particular moment. Maybe you are, you are thinking about your job or how to solve a problem or whatever, some aspects of your life, uh, and really uh, crunching them heavily. Then this absent-minded, because of this beautiful scenery of nature, uh, suddenly locks out all distractions. And in, this, in that period, while you are absent-minded, however, this is a modest state. It's not a completely clear state as the first jhana. So there's a difference there. But they share the, the lack of time sensation. So you, you, if you come out of the jhana, you cannot really say whether or come out of an absent-minded period. You cannot say whether there was two minutes or seven minutes or 27 minutes past. You see some very vague sensation of time. It has some uh, connotation to what in modern neurology is called temporary hypofrontality, where the whole prefrontal cortex is kind of like dampened down. And one should think that's a funny thing because uh, all the rest is basically sensation and motoric activity. How can you take the mind out of uh, working and then, then do very intense thinking? So it says something about this mind-body problem. That mind seems to be something else than the activity going on in the brain. It's correlated with that, but it's, it's not identical to that. The philosophy of mind is a whole science field that tries to delineate what is it what is the connection between what we call mind and the brain? And there's no, no good explanation about uh, that so far. It's a scientific, active scientific field, and also an active philosoph uh, philosophical field and psychology, uh, psychological field of knowledge. But you cannot, I just know that interestingly enough, when you think most when you're absent-minded, when you think most intensely, and also something that you can see with artists and with sports people, uh, when they are doing their sports most intensively, and when the artists are painting their paintings most, if you make a scanning then that, then you'll also see that the frontal cortex, the activity in the frontal cortex has gone down significantly. They're stilling their mind. And what's the new age people call the flow? You're into a kind of flow where it's, it's it seems to be spontaneous what is happening. And this points to that maybe one should give up this uh, very uh, ancient notion of that there's an identical identity between the mind and the brain. This doesn't seem to be the case because when the mind is most active, the, the only part that we can, by scanning, refer the mind to, the personal mind to, and for example also the sensation of time, this is the frontal cortex. And the frontal cortex seems to be shut down when you're doing intense thinking and in the first jhana. While the, the opposite should be supposed to be the case. But this is not the case.
So there's some inconsistency there. Nevertheless, uh, both the sensation of time and also the sensation of self is also gone away. You doesn't have so sh sharp notion of who you are or where you are in a group. Uh, the absent-minded, he's he doesn't sense the other at all. They can be talking in the background; doesn't matter. Uh, he doesn't sense him as other beings, and he doesn't sense himself or herself as a being as an individual. So there's completely absorption on the focus of the thought. That's uh, another feature of the jhana, that the subject-object normal, that you have a, a subject, an experiencer, that experiences an object, a cup, that is external, is sensa in sense that's external to the su subject, to the experiencer. That's false away. There's a kind of like a fusion between the subject and the object. So there's, a, there's no subject-object dilemma in the first jhana. Uh, the second thing is that the, the, the perspective uh, can be widely different from normal perception. This is to say that you can see uh, or perceive the object from multiple uh, angles and at multiple uh, level of microscopy or, micro or microscopy uh, at the same time. If I should say it allegorically, then you can say it's like uh, seeing a house and being inside the house at the same time. Seeing the house from the front and from the back and from an aeroplane far above and from uh, down under the ground looking up uh, or from inside the basement and even from inside one of the uh, cement grains in, in, in one of the cement parts of the house, and inside the, the, the beam of uh, one of the wooden uh, beams in, in the roof at the same time. So this means that there's no perspective, in, uh, no fixed perspective, in, because it seems that like the experiencer can, can experience from all angles and at all levels of uh, size at the same time simultaneously. Usually there will not be so many perspectives, but there will be more than one perspective at the same time in the perception. It seems to me that what you're perceiving here is not the object as it is, a, a cup seen from a certain angle where you can see it has a handle or where you cannot see it has a handle, for example. Now if I turn the perspective, you cannot see it has a handle. Now you can see it has a handle. Huh? So it's a widely different information you get from the different perspectives, with handle, without handle. Uh, this is not the case in the first jhana. There's no perspective on the experience. So what you do, I think, is perceive, because there's fusion between the object and the subject, is perceive the information directly. And that is what in, in Buddhist philosophy is called anya, direct knowledge. There's no perception process intervening where there necessarily has to be a perspective. So you are perceiving the object directly as it is. This also includes seeing it at, from multiple angles uh, or perceiving it at multiple levels of zooming in and zooming out of the object. Zooming into microscopy, a uh, microscopic level and zooming out to very large uh, macroscopic level. This is very interesting. Uh, when it happens, because it's not something normally one uh, experiences. If I should say a little bit uh, how it can be like, then it's something. Uh, it's, it's something that you see something also at television, for example. In if there's a tennis match, you see the face of the tennis player. Somebody zooming up, overlaid another face, another picture of where one see his uh, full-size body serving the serve, for example. So you see his facial as expressing uh, magnified on the, uh, on the whole screen, and then you also see his full body serving at the same time. And maybe you have a small inset uh, up at the corner where you see the opponent, how he's, uh, how he's uh, leaning back and forth uh, to catch the ball when it comes. So that you actu you're actually seeing three perspectives on that television screen, 
of course only in one plane uh, at the same time. So mind can easily handle that. It doesn't doesn't make any mistake of seeing in three perspectives. Here it's more like these pictures are overlaid. In China they are more overlaid. They can also be at the television screen. Uh, it's easy to make in, in video graphics. Huh? So overlaid pieces, if you fade in into one picture and then fade out, then there will be two pictures at the same screen uh, at the same time. So also in first jhana, there's more than one uh, picture at the same time. But it's the same object. So this is this is an, a factor of what we call ikka jhana, chitta. Ikka, one, jhana, going, uh, chitta, mind. Mind going only one place. Mind having only one object. That's why it's getting absorbed into the object, because it only has one object. Now you probably have the illusion that you see me and hear me and understand what I'm saying at the same time, simultaneously. But that's not the case at the microscopic time level. If you compress the time, you'll only have one object in a mind at a time, then you'll change to the other choice. Either you will see what's happening on the screen, or for a very short time you will hear what is being said, or for a very short time you will understand what is being said, and then you will shift back very very quickly between these three modes of perception, and then you get the illusion uh, that all these frames of experience that you are sampling, that they are coming to you continuously. But uh, there you are actually jumping between three objects, a visual object, an auditory object, and a mental object three objects jumping into the mind. That's not the case in the jhana. There's only one object, or two, if you're doing breath meditation. So this reduces uh, the, the way you can say the same light you have with the mind, instead of shining it on three objects, or usually more than three objects, multiple objects, you shine it on only one object. Then it's drilling right through it. It's getting absorbed into it easily. So uh, it's just a matter of focus, simply. So the same amount of light or attention is now focused on only one object. And it's the same object from one moment to the next moment, from one moment to the next moment, from one moment to the next moment. It's keep on being the same object. That is ikkajana sita, one pointedness of mind one-pointedness of mind. Very pleasurable state that increases pleasure and joy. So much for the experience. Uh, now, how to attain it? It's a tricky thing. I say first, it's a tricky thing. Not many can do it. But those who can't do it, they will have a large benefit for it. And even those who cannot do it will have a benefit of trying. There is some levels one comes through first, and we we you say first is parikama, the preliminary levels of concentration. Then there comes some small blinks of it, where it's not full entry, but you kind of like going in of absorption out again, going in of absorption out again, going in and absorption out again. Maybe a split second or a few seconds, kanika samadhi, momentary concentration. Then you're around in the neighborhood of this absorption. You are like walking around the house or standing in front of the door, but you're not entered into the house of the jhana. It's called neighborhood concentration or access concentration, upachara samadhi. Then when you have entered the door, don't pull the door. Don't push the door. Don't want the jhana to happen because it, then it doesn't happen. You cannot urge it. And I'll explain why. It's a sense desire there. If you urge it, then you have a sense desire for a mental state. Then jhana cannot happen. So don't push the door. Don't pull it. You come up to the door, then it will open by itself. Then you just go in. Often you don't notice this, that you're in. So uh, this is called appana samadhi. This is the full absorption. Remember the text? He enters and dwells. He enters and remains in the first jhana. 
full of joy and pleasure. Direct thought and sustained thinking. Born of the solitude of seclusion. What does it mean by seclusion here? It means that you are physically secu secluded from your surroundings and from other people. That's physical seclusion. Then there's mental seclusion. You are secluded, separated from the five mental defilements. Sense desire, aversion, laziness, restlessness and uncertainty. When you are separated from them, then it can happen. If they are present, then it cannot happen. So how can they not be present momentarily? Then there, this is the preliminaries. The preliminaries is a, a fairly long period of training where one purifies the morality. Why is that? Because one has to have absence of regret and remorse while you're sitting on the pillow. And you haven't absence of, and regret of, or absence of regret and remorse. You have regret and remorse if you have not purified your morality to a, a quite high degree, actually. So it, it takes an ultimately clear conscience and innocence and the mental elation of this innocence that you know you're innocent. You know you've done nothing wrong. It can be small, small things uh, in irritation, killing, and mosquito. Uh, not following the precepts uh, properly, perfectly, uh, forgetting a, an upositate day, a prayer day, an observance day, small other things. So it's something that really, uh, one really has to practice hard to get it right. And a little bit right or almost right is not enough for jhana. You have to get it perfectly right to get access to this mental state. And this takes training. And that's where when people come here and say they have difficulties with jhana and difficulties with absorption, uh, then it's a main, 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 main problem. It it's not, has nothing to do when they are on the pillow. It has something to do with what they do out in their normal life. That affects their mental state when they are trying to reach jhana on the pillow. They have not purified their morality. Remember the old saying, Sila, Samadhi, Panya. Sila, morality. Then Sila, if you have Sila, you get Samadhi. Concentration, absorption. If you have concentration, absorption, you get Panya, understanding, wisdom. So Sila comes first. Sila, first. Then Samadhi. Try secondly, huh? And then Panya. Sila, Samadhi, Panya. They say, the old people. The ancient elders, they say it always that. So this one should remember. Look carefully, carefully into your life if you have these difficulties with the thing in jhana. And then purify it. Purify it. It should be like a mirror. There should be not, not a spot. Not a single atomic spot on this mirror. Clean it with a razor. Polish it. To get it really clean, this morality, this sealer. When it's really green, <laughs> uh, really fine, and for a prolonged period, then this innocence come in. This innocence elates this elates the mind. It's like an innocent child, and this is a key actually because this joy and happiness, sukha, gives pleasure on the pillow and lack of re regret and remorse, and this happiness is uh, the key that is the proximate cause of the absorption to occur. So it has to be there. You have to be happy to attain jhana. You're not happy if you have regret and remorse. And you will have regret and remorse in whatever, from whatever kind of overstepping the moral rules, either in a small or a big degree. It can be something that also you've done for many years ago, that you kind of like, not have kind of like exhausted, or maybe not admitted to yourself that you did. Then it's guarding the senses. Uh, so one should be have absence of temptation, of greed, desire, and attraction to any kind of sense object, to anything you can see, anything you can hear, anything you can uh, uh, smell, anything you can taste, anything you can touch, and anything you can uh, have as a mental state. So this means that there, there cannot be any kind of 
uh, one should guard the senses in a normal life also, because otherwise one will get overwhelmed when one comes to the pillow and sits on the pillow. Then one get overwhelmed by, for example, sexual desire. Uh, if you have seen a pornographic image uh, one hour ago, then this image will sit in your mind and keep coming back to you. There will be a sex desire there. Then forget about first jhana. It's impossible because the mind keeps having these sexual uh, uh, connotations or uh, mind pictures that are coming in, flowing in on the mind and cause it to have desire. When it has desire and this desire is not satisfied, then of course the mind is unhappy. When it's unhappy, there's no proximate cause for absorption, for concentration to occur. Well, it cannot occur. So guarding the senses. Clear comprehension is another preliminary. Is to say there should be acute awareness and acute mental presence. This is something that you also train in your daily life. When you stretch an arm, you know you stretch an arm. When you bend an arm, you know you bend an arm. When you turn the head, you know you turn the head. You turn your head back, you know you turn the head back. When you're in the toilet, you know you're in the toilet. When you are eating, you know what you're eating. When you're swallowing, you know what you're swallowing. You're always labeling twice. Swallowing, swallowing. Tasting, tasting. Touching, touching. Sleeping, sleeping. Lying, lying. Standing, standing. Walking, walking. Whatever you do, label it twice. This is clear comprehension. Then there should be contentment. A calm and still satisfaction, even with nothing. Contentment comes from what? Com contentment comes with mu mutual joy, mudita that you're happy over others' success. For example, that others can attain jhana, and that others are experienced meditators, that others are rich, that they're beautiful, they're young and famous and whatever they can be. And you rejoice in that. Ah, how good is that? Then contentment comes. Sanctuti. Instead of being envious or jealous, then there comes discontent then no happiness, then no concentration, then no jhana. So, uh, if you look more microscopically, at the moment of entry, what are the mental factors there? There are five that are present and five that are absent. Let's take the absent first. There should be absence of any urge of sense desire. You should not want to see something or eat something or taste something or take something, drugs, or go some else or whatever. Any urge of desire should, even urge for jhana, importantly, should not be there. There should be absence to, to absence of any aversion and anger, any opposition, not wanting to be on the pillow, or angry with your mother, or with some other people, or whoever. There should be no aversion, because then happiness cannot be there, joy cannot be there. There should be no laziness, no drowsiness or lethargy. There three, there should be no restlessness and regret. Restlessness is this kind of unrest and regret was this thing that you are kind of like, and also can, you, because it's called a worry or remorse, that you've done something uh, wrong or made a mistake and then you, you sit speculating and the, on the pillow. And then there should be absence of doubt and uncertainty. You should not be in doubt whether you, what you're doing now is, is good or bad, or what you should do about it, and how you should attain jhana, for example. If there's doubt about that, then this is enough for jhana not to happen. So this was the five things, this is the five mental hindrances that should not be there. No sense desire, no aversion, no laziness, no restlessness, no regret, no uncertainty, no doubt. Then there's five things that should be present at, right at the moment of entry. That is direct thought, sustained thinking, rapturous joy, piti, pleasurable bliss, sukha, and single-pointed focus, ikkajana, citta, one-pointedness of mind. This should be there. These ten factors should be relatively absent and present. At the same time, when these five things are absent and present at the same time, in conjunction with each other, poof, the doors open. Then you're inside. As soon as one of them falls out, you're outside again. 
for example, can happen. You you come in first time and say, ooh, ooh, wow, 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 wow. And then you start liking it. Then you start wanting it. Poof out. Then you stand outside the door. <laughs> open again, open again, open again. No, 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 no. Forget about it. That's because there's this craving, craving for a mental state, in this case, jhana. So, again, if we go to the subjective experience, intense presence, intense awareness, effortless, undistracted and focused thinking, attention anchored anchored even at ease on any chosen object you like. Mind is fixed and unified. The final end result of any reasoning is always reached quickly and successfully. There's joy, there's bliss and there's happiness mixed into a solid calm, just like a smiling mouth. Just like a smiling mountain on a frosty, clear day. So is it, really. If we go over some of the technical issues again, there's some stages. First stage, directing. Directing to the, adverting to the sign of serenity. That is to say, you have attained jhana, or let's just say samadha, calm, one time before, then you remember it. Remember it. Remember it. How did you come? How does it taste? How does it look? This sign inside your mind, this meditative state. Remember all aspects of it. And also how you were brought there, what, what happened there, on your way to it, and how did you come out of it again. So, so you remember the sign. Remember the sign. Nimitta, of whatever is the highest state of, of, of mental calm you ever have attained. Remember that. While you're in it, remember it. Protect the sign, this, the, the ancient elders always said. Protect the sign. Why? Because then you can find back to it. If you don't have the sign in your mind, the taste, the experience, the remembrance about the experience, the, the specificities of it, how it was, uh, how you came there, what caused it, how it's like, the feeling of it, the taste of it, the touch of it, then you cannot find back because you, the characteristics has kind of like been muddled up. So remember it, remember it, remember it. Attaining entrance and stabilizing attaining entrance. This is second praxis. So you can, you can go and you can come inside the door. The door opens, you go inside, and enter the first jhana. And then stabilize this, you can come up to the door, and the door open, and you go inside. Second stage of, of training. Third stage is prolonging and controlling the duration of the jhana. So you can say, instead of having only two or three seconds of a time, then you can have one minute, 10 seconds, one minute, one hour, seven hours, seven days in jhana. This you, you, you determine at the first, before you start to meditate. Then you'll come out of the first jhana after seven days, in the ideal case. Emergence from this absorption, so you have control. This is uh, the fourth training that you kind of like, okay, so you come in, but also how to come out again. So you have deliberate control of how to come in and how to come out. So you're not thrown out, for example, by your own sense desire or aversion or irritation that or, uh, for example, aversion to against not attaining it, uh, or not being able to come out, for example. So the emergence from the absorption is also important. This is four stages of training, and then reviewing, looking back. How is how was it? Reviewing is a state is a state where you fix down the remembrance of the state, where you fix the sign in the mind, so you can protect it on. So you can find back to the same mental state. So five stages of training. Directing, attaining, prolonging, 
emergence and reviewing. Technical issues. There was this great, uh, again, there's Parikama Samadhi, where you are still training to get access, but not have access. Kanika Samadhi, momentary access, seconds of seconds approach, access concentration on neighborhood uh, concentration, Upachara Samadhi, and full absorption, fixed and anchored on a given freely chosen object, Appana Samadhi. That more or less covers uh, the ground of the first jhana, I think. Uh, the, the jhana absorptions, there are 40 meditations object. Not all of them can induce jhana. Uh, awareness of breathing, anapanasati, can induce all four rupa jhanas. All four rupa jhanas. Very neat technique. Uh, casino meditation on the colors, for example, or on space or on conscious, can induce only one jhana. Uh, inner organs, uh, corpses, Kaya a discussed meditation, first jhana, first rupa jhana. The four infinite divine states, the Brahma Viharas, this infinite friendliness, uh, infinite mutual joy, infinite compassion or pity, and infinite equanimity or imperturbability, they can induce, uh, Metta can induce uh, the first jhana only, and equanimity can induce all the four jhanas. Uh, pity can induce this up to the second jhana, and uh, mutual joy, mudita, can induce up to the third jhana. The four formless states can induce the four uh, arupa jhanas, but it's always start with the first jhana. You cannot jump to any of the other the higher jhanas without. I recommend, uh, and I will give a link to it, uh, that you study uh, the path of purification. And there's also a small one on the jhanas in early Buddhist Theravada. Uh, in early Buddhist Theravada Buddhism, that I will give links to below. Again, uh, if we come back to the main hindrance for people not attaining jhana, is lack of sila, lack of pure morality which induce remorse and regret and thereby filters out the happiness that comes from innocence and thereby filters out the proximate cause uh, of absorption of concentration to occur, namely this happiness, this sukkha, that has to be there. Remember that one of the five things that has to be there was actually uh, two things was presence of rapturous joy, piti, and presence of pleasurable bliss, sukkha. They have to be present. They are not present if if one has regrets or remorse over this or over that. And even over a small thing, actually. I think I will check again the, the Buddhist uh, a explanation of all the four jhanas because I think it's a very very beautiful description it's given on the, the text where he explains what is Sama Samadhi a, a factor of the Noble Eightfold Path so there's a fourfold definition of right concentration Having eliminated the five mental hindrances, mental defects that obstruct understanding, and quite secluded from sense desires, protected from any detrimental mental states, one enters and dwells in the first jhana, full of joy and pleasure, born of solitude, joined with directed and sustained thought. One makes this joy and pleasure, born of seclusion, drench, saturate, soak and suffuse the entire body so that no part of the entire body is unperfused by this intense joy and pleasure. Just as a skilled bathman puts soap powder in a copper basin and sprinkling it gradually with water, whips it until it, the water soaks and pervades all the soap powder 
yet without dripping, so too does a noble friend make this joy and pleasure born of solitude permeate and pervade the entire body. Again, friends, with the stilling of directed and sustained thoughts, hear no thinking. One enters and dwells in the second jhana, a calm assurance of unication of mind with even deeper joy and pleasure, now born of concentration, devoid of any thought. One makes this exquisite joy and pleasure, born of concentration, drench, saturate, soak and suffuse the entire body so that no part of the body is unperfused by this profound joy and pleasure. Just as a lake whose water waters welled up from below within it itself and has no other source of water coming from without, no other showers of rain, then this cool fount of water welling up from a deep within would immerse, fill, pervade the entire lake. And even in exactly so does one make this joy and pleasure born of concentration, infuse the entire body. I'd just like to say that second jhana, another subjective uh, experience of the second jhana is like coming into a very large hall, like a, a giant cathedral. inside your own mind. And that's completely still. That's completely still. The stillness inside this imaginary mental room, which is enormous, gigantic, spacious, yet still enclosed, is that the, the calm, the stillness inside there is almost tactile. So you feel like you can cut into it like a knife cut through butter. So it's semi-tactile. There's no thinking. No thinking whatsoever of anything. And that's why this calm is, is exquisite to, to another degree that, that you probably have ever experienced in your entire, entire comic career. It's very addictive. Furthermore, friends, with the fading away of joy, the friend dwells in even equanimity, just aware and clearly comprehending. Still feeling pleasure of the body, one enters and remains in the third jhana, which the noble ones declare, in aware equanimity, one dwells in pleasure. One makes this pleasure apart from joy, flood, saturate, soak, suffuse the body, so there's no part of one's whole body unperfused by this pleasure divested of joy. Just as in a lotus pond, some lotuses are born and grow and thrive immersed under the water, and the cool water soaks them from the root to the tips, so does a noble friend make this pleasure divested of joy, drench, fill, flood and pervade this entire body. Finally, friends, with the leaving behind of both pleasure and pain, and with the prior disappearance of both joy and sorrow, both gladness and sadness, one enters and dwells in the fourth jhana, a completely stilled mental state of awareness, purified by an equanimity of neither pain nor pleasure. One sits illuminating the body internally illuminating the body from inside with a, this pure, bright mind so that no part of one's whole body not illuminated by this pure, bright mind. Just as a man was sitting covered from head down with a white cloth so that no part of his entire body was uncovered by this white textile, 
even so does one sit encompassing this entire body with a pure, bright and radiant mind. So there's no part of one's whole body not illuminated by this pure, bright and luminous mind. It's worth noticing that, that the Buddha, in another place, describes the mind as appasara. Appasara, it means that it's, it's something that can shine uh, on everything. And it doesn't shine like a lamp from outside and then has a direction of light. It shines from everywhere. And here you see that there's, there's not some non-locality embedded in this description. Because it's not like a lamp that shines out from a, from a given point, like a point like emission of, of radiation. It's not like that. That's one aspect of it. It will shine on everything. If it's not covered by any the mental defilement, then it will shine on everything. There is to be seen or to be perceived as an object. There's another aspect of it, and that is it shines from everywhere at the same time. And this, this is the fourth jhana is where you uh, shine up uh, the entire body with this pure bright mind. Coming out of the fourth jhana, emergence from the fourth jhana is the access, is giving access to the superpowers like elevation, uh, swimming through the earth, going through barriers, appearance, disappearance. Uh, free free choice of uh, color and form and size, uh, because it's it's a determination that happens in the first jhana. When you come out of the f fourth uh, jhana, then this uh, sorry the determination in the first in the fourth jhana. If you come out of the fourth jhana, then this uh, absorbed determination will occur. So it's a frozen uh, state there. Personally, it, this is just some theoretical speculation I have myself. Why does this happen? It happens because the uh, amplitude of the mind there is so focused uh, that whatever it determines uh, is adding to, uh, you can say, what, what is an event? There's a, the, the, the observer comes with some amplitude of probability. That's basically the same as saying his amplitude of his consciousness, how conscious he is about this given object or given event. His consciousness is a wave phenomena, but he can modulate the intensity that is the height of this wave phenomena, which will again will give the height of the probability wave that is emanating from his consciousness. So the observer comes with one probability distribution of a given size. Then nature comes with another probability distribution. And these two are then mixed together and interfere. There's interference. And if this interference is constructive, then comes out a resulting probability for given states to occur. In the fourth jhana, the, the, the amplitude wave of the observer, the meditator in this case, has been so large that it's, that it's kind of like overtaking the nature's uh, component. So whatever uh, the, first, the fourth jhana meditator, he says should happen, that will happen. Because he's inducing it with such a high probability because of the the wave is uh, the intensity of the mind has gotten the wave uh, of of consciousness and thereby also the orthogonal wave of probability so high that it's is impossible for it not to happen but there's some technical issues first jhana is the goal for any meditator to to reach let's go back to the questions again uh, how does it feel when one is in first jhana? This we have covered. How to practice in order to attain the first jhana? This we have covered. If one practices only anapanasati, breathing meditation, and not give importance to vipassana meditation, inside meditation, is it then possible to attain jhana samasamadhi? Yes, it is. But I'd like, just like to say it's a misunderstanding that if you practice all the 16 steps, in breathing meditation, in anapanasati meditation, then you will automatically also do some inside meditation because the last two uh, tetras, the last eight points of the 16 points, they are basically vipassana. And uh, the two first tetras are basically samatha, calm meditation. 
is uh, of course the calm that gives the absorption. However, it's the vipassana that tells you gradually what to do and what not to do on the higher scale of the absolute level. So, uh, calm and insight, samatha vipassana, it's not two different things. They are two different things, but they go hand in hand in this process. One should not kind of like try to only cultivate one. That's foolish, because you cannot do it properly. You have to have some insight to get proper calm. And you have to have some proper calm to get proper insight. So they are mutually dependent. They're dependent on each other. And that's why if they go really hand in hand and should be seen as friends and not as opposites. So the question, the answer to this question is yes, indeed, indeed, indeed. Anapanasati is very, very good to induce jhana. It can make all four rupa jhanas access to them. All four rupa jhanas. Not many other techniques can do that. Then this question for. As lay people living in the West, how do we continue to motivate ourselves to practicing the Noble Eightfold Way? Yes, it's some insight to say, what well, if you don't do it? Then there will be crashing. Why is that? Because if one doesn't make, even if one doesn't make any mistakes, one is using up one's prior karma, which was holding up this airplane of a being that is floating in the human state and not falling down into the state of an animal or a hungry ghost or a demon or a hell being. So it's held up by what? By probability. It's held up by karma. So if you don't r replenish, if you don't put more juice in the tank, in the karma account, then you you lose height. You just suddenly fall down, down, fall down, fall down, fall down, fall down, fall down, fall down until you crash. That's, what do I mean by crash? What I mean by crash is to say what happens at your moment of death. You lose the human state. If you lose the human state, you cannot train. It, animals have very, very little ability to lift them up by their own hair. And that's why we say the human state is a happy state. It's not because everybody is happy. It's because they have a chance to make themselves happy, to lift them up, comically speaking, to do something good, to train meditation, to study Buddhism. The danger is immense. Not many get a human state again, especially today. Very few, very few. Is that less than one hundred thousand? Very few. So to fall down is so easy, and to come back is so 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 difficult, so 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 difficult. So this is seeing this danger of falling down. This is something that happens gradually through one's life, through complacency. One thinks, ah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yesterday it doesn't matter, so it doesn't matter today also. No, it matters. Every minuscule, every moment you direct your attention to this, and thereby away from something else. All 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 the alternatives they are skipped by directing attention to this or that. If you see a bad movie on the video, yes, then you cannot meditate at the same time. So waste of time. Huh? Where only greed and ignorance and desire goes up. Aversion, probably also. So he's seeing this danger, danger, atinava, that induces a sense of urgency, samvega, induces a sense of urgency. A sense of urgency is the opposite of complacency, which is ridding the entire world at the moment. Because the entire world is nihilist, they don't think there is any life after death. So they will have this nasty surprise that there is, because that's a fact. But then it's too late for them to regenerate or recreate the circumstances that creates a good transmigration. And by good, I mean a transmigration that will result in a, another human life or in a higher than human life. They have no chance at that. They are already in it. They will be ripped out of the human state at the moment of death. So he's seeing this danger uh, coming, sneaking up from behind. 
and then knowing one is if one doesn't replenish uh, the karmic account uh, by doing something good, something advantageous throughout your life, then you are you are using up probabilities. You are exhausting them, like uh, driving a car. You're using up gasoline. It doesn't seem so from moment to moment, but it is so. If you look after some time after on the gasoline meter, then you see ah, you use so much gasoline. Unfortunately, you don't have any meter to meter your karmic accumulation of good and to, that makes you, keeps you up in this state. And we say your karmic accumulation is the only support what is keeping you up. Beings have in samsara only support. So. Uh, keep practicing is by understanding this danger more and more and more. Understanding how acute the danger is. And how terrible it is to fall down because you cannot come back. You don't even know that you have been falling down. A blind animal doesn't know who it was. But that goes for most beings. They don't know where they come from, from where they are born. The, the last life they cannot remember. They don't know where they're going. The next life they don't see, they don't understand. They don't know the, the causes that brought them from where they came from, what actions they did that made them end up in their prior rebirth. And they don't know what will bring them into the next rebirth either, which causes will bring them into the next rebirth either. So this is a very risky situation. Uh, it's like uh, driving where you're blindfolded, with your hands, on, uh, your feet on the speeder, and there's no brake, and your hands is locked and bound uh, on your back. You cannot touch the wheel. Sooner it will go. The the car will go off the road. Of course, of course, under these circumstances. But this is basically the same circumstances that beings have in normal state. They don't know where they come from. They don't know where they're going. And they don't know the causes bringing them to wherever they came from or to wherever they're going. They don't know. But one can come to know. That's the purpose of Buddhist philosophy and training. And that's why you should practice. It's your only chance, really only chance on the long run. Uh, I hope this uh, answers this question. The last question is, question five is, what is the best way to make merit pin out of the various rate of making merit and how does one transfer merit pin punya to the deceased relative and how long can you do this for? Do you have to transfer merit immediately after they pass away or can you keep transferring merit for a long time after? He didn't, uh, regarding merit, which is basically the same as probability, uh, which is basically the same as karma. Uh, merit is something good, a good accumulation. It's the probability that something good will happen to you in the future, accumulated by you doing good now and having done good in the past. That is merit. It's called pin in here in singular, punya in Pali. And it's basically an accumulation of probability if I should say in Western terms. So you have a bank account of probability that can be smeared out on many different kinds of events or it can be focused on s some single events. In one, Normally, uh, probabilities are s uh, frequency specific, that is to say that they are coupled to one single consciousness. They cannot be transferred. But there is one single case where they can be transferred. And that has to do with this uh, beings that they have this state. There are eight kinds of petas, uh, eight kinds of hungry ghosts. One out of the eight kinds can get mirror if, if one of their family members in uh, from seven generations back or in seven generations forward, they uh, after they have become peta, then they donate some mirror to them. Then they can gain from it and thereby be liberated from their uh, hungry ghost state. And the reason we can say that for sure is that there is actually in the Dikanikaya there is a story about Sariputta, the uh, general of the Dhamma, 
the right hand disciple of the Buddha, that he was uh, at a visit at the king and he was giving some speech, Dhamma speech. And there were some humans collected there and there was also a lot of devas there collected there, listening, divine beings listening. Then a hungry ghost in her level came up and also wanted to participate in this forum. But uh, she was kept at bay by the devas say, you cannot get any access here. Boss off. And since she said, uh, no, 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 let, let me come in, come, let me come into presence of my son. And then they ask, how can you say son? Uh, for for, for uh, seven lives ago, I was his mother. I was Sariputta's mother. And then they let him, let, let her come in to the forum and make a complaint that she was now in a terrible state. And that she was in this Peter state where you cannot get any food, where you're constantly hungry. Uh, and we have a lot of pain and very dissatisfied in all respects of that uh, word. And so Sariputta said, okay, uh, since you have been my mother for seven lives ago, and since I still have a chance of donating to you, I will take care of it. So he asked the king to, to uh, he, he, uh, this king was present, and he referred to him, the king couldn't, uh, c couldn't see the, uh, the ghost, but Sariputta could see her. Something a sampling of time frequency. I'll come back to that later. But nevertheless, he told the king uh, the matter, and then the king said, "Okay, Sariputta, I give you seven meditation huts, seven kutis." Then the king built seven kutis, complete with uh, walking path, uh, uh, water vessels, uh, sleeping bed, everything. And then uh, the Buddha he gave him to the sangha. He gave him to the sangha. The, the community of disciples. Uh, in this case, the uh, disciples that were ordained to other monks, basically, that any other monk could use him. He did trick, take them as personal. And then he dedicated this merit from these seven meditation huts that was his, because he, he's got them from the king. He dedicated this to his mother. And right there, she was freed from this ghost state. So she vanished from there and was reborn elsewhere on a higher level. So that's why, because of this story, we know that this is correct. However, you cannot infer merit to somebody else that is in another state. You cannot, for example, infer merit to animals, or to devas, or anything else at yourself, because they are frequency specific. They have specific address. So the karmic accumulation, there's only this case. It will work in seven generations back, and in seven generations forward. And that's why there is this habit of generating of uh, donating merit in the East even today. Uh, because you don't know who your parents were seven, seven lifetimes ago, and you don't know whether uh, they have stolen something, for example, and then become a, a hungry ghost now. And f because of this option, it's very kind, kind action to do, to dedicate the merit uh, to whoever have been in your family seven lives ago. And if any of them is just one out of eight, Peter, Peter kinds, then they can gain from it. They can gain from it at whatever time, both right after they have died, or 10 years after, or 100 years after, or 200,000 years after, doesn't matter. If you dedicate the mirror specifically to, the, to them, even not knowing who they are, you can say, in all my family, in seven generations back, when you give a present, may those who have become hungry Peters uh, at that particular within this time frame, may they be freed from there. Then they can gain from it. But otherwise, transference of, meta, uh, of merit is not possible. Uh, karma is specific, individual, because of consciousness is frequency specific, has only one frequency. This means that the probability has to hit the right frequency, and that they cannot be transferred to any other, and that has another frequency. It won't interfere with their wave phenomena, and thereby their uh, future events. I hope this uh, answers all the questions for today. Uh, yes, I like uh, uh, maybe the, once. Uh, this also, what's the best way to make merit? There's three ways we can say: dana, sila, bhavana. Dana is giving something, give something to the worthy, and then those who are pure, and to the needy, then those who are poor. Uh, pure and poor, uh, give to those, give with a happy heart, 
and find the most noble you can to give to, uh, and give the uh, best object that you can. That's the dana part, the generosity part. Another way of generating, which is equally good, is to seal, purify morality, not killing, not stealing, not sexually abusing, uh, not verbally abusing, not intoxicating, not lying. This also, uh, the also accumulating of merit. Then bhavana, bhavana means development. Development by what? By dhamma study, reflection, not regular meditation, but reflection while you're going or sitting down or talking with other people. Reflection of what, what is the Dhamma? What is the reality on the ultimate level? And then regular meditation on the pillar. This is the three ways. Just remember the phrase Dana, Sina, Bhavana. Dana, giving, generosity. Sila, purify morality. Bhavana, development. By Dhamma study and meditation. Thank you for today. One hour, ten minutes, and fifty-seven seconds. Namo, tasso, bhagavato, arahato, samma, sambuddhasa, worthy, honorable, and perfectly self-enlightened. This is the blessed Buddha. Thank you for your attention and have a nice day.